thank you so much for the invitation. I would like to, I would like to begin uh, while you are putting on your headphones and uh, seeking the translation to thank the translators. I've been enjoying their work for the past two days. And they've been uh, tremendous. They've been able to translate a very, uh, a, a very radical program, if I may say. I thought maybe the translators were a little bit radical, but it is the program, it is the speakers. <laughs> uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Anna Agira and uh, the people of uh, Langkor, and uh, especially Nerea Valeo. <laughs> no? More or less. Uh, the translators, they are uh, Diana and Olga. Uh, this is the name of my, uh, this is the name of my uh, organization, Jabretistova. We are, as uh, introduced uh, now under the Prime Minister's office, having been uh, moved by the current Prime Minister, Katrin Jakobsdóttir. Katrin Jakobsdóttir is the Prime Minister of a coalition government of left, center and right wing uh, political parties. And uh, she took uh, power in 2017 after two elections and a, a long period of negotiations. Uh, the Left Greens are a socialist party and uh, as a socialist party they are uh, feminist and uh, have been driving the agenda and the discussion on, on feminist politics for the last 20 years. Uh, she is uh, herself uh, reasonably uh, young in, in, in both the years and political years. Uh, she was, and I, and I, I hope I can uh, tell you about this, uh, she was initially invited to come here, uh, was not able to attend, but she sent uh, you all her uh, warmest <coughs> regards, her greetings, and uh, she was uh, given an introduction about, uh, about the conference and the program and was very impressed, impressed about the uh, radical uh, headings of the, of the, speak, of the uh, topics from the speakers. And I know she would have been, like I am myself, I'm impressed by the amount of uh, very uh, concrete radical suggestions that come forth in, in your your uh, notes and your, your sorry, your uh, speeches. Uh, I spoke with my wife yesterday. My wife, uh, she lives in Norway. I live in Iceland. I'm in Spain now. She's coming from Russia. And uh, I'm complaining. I've been traveling for two days, uh, more or less, uh, from North Iceland. And I, I came here yesterday morning, and I wasn't able to get any coffee. It was too late. I, woke, I was sleeping bad, and I woke up late. But it didn't really matter because uh, in the morning we had uh, Rosa Cabo and uh, she really did uh, wake me up <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh, interesting to have such a, a powerful presentation in the beginning of the conference. And then it just kept on going. And uh, yesterday I did not uh, feel tired at all and the program continues now for the second day and, and I've been uh, uh, looking forward to uh, telling uh, my colleagues at the, at the office about, about your conference. Uh, Rosa told you and, and she criticized a little bit the history of uh, uh, gender mainstreaming. It came as right from my heart. I've been working with gender equality issues for, for, ten, for nine years, uh, officially for ten years now. Um, and teaching gender mainstreaming. And this is our uh, experience. We drive programs for government officials, public offices, which are perceived as a little too complicated. But more and more, we have come to the conclusion, we just need something from you. If you are not able to mainstream gender through all your decisions and your policy making, please just give us something. And. Uh, I was, uh, it is not a surprise I've been following this uh, debate in Sweden as well. Uh, I think uh, possibly we're at the point now where we need to uh, find uh, better solutions. And uh, no doubt they will be more, more feminist. Uh, at the same time, uh, Rosa criticized uh, a little bit the provincial government uh, of uh, Kiputska 
if I, if I understood still correctly. Uh, I am, uh, as a government official, very sensitive to this type of criticism, but understand it, of course. But let us remember and uh, remind ourselves, they are providing us with this platform to voice our critical opinions, and I think uh, it is a, a great uh, work you have been doing. Uh, it is the uh, second time I, I visit the Basque country, and uh, as it is the second time, I was suggested by a friend, you should start uh, reading a little bit of the history of the Basque country. Uh, this friend of mine is, a, is, a, is a, a great fan of your culture. So I found a book, and it was named The Basque History of the World. Yes? Uh, written by uh, Mark uh, Kulansky, and uh, uh, this struck a note a little bit in my heart as an Icelander. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, how you perceive the world and your uh, influence on it, a uh, little bit like Icelanders do. Uh, we, we, we are, like the Basque, a little bit the center of the world. Uh, uh, as, uh, as I intend to do, uh, I will give you uh, some insight into what we do. I will do this quite quickly as, uh, as, uh, as I know that uh, we are running out of, uh, of minutes to speak. I will, I will possibly speak a little quickly. So, uh, the Center for Gender Equality, now the Directorate of Gender Equality, we administer the Gender Equality Act. That is, we implement the Act. We drive. Uh, questions to companies and public organizations and to government about what they are doing, about what they are supposed to do uh, according to the Act. I won't go into detail, but uh, we make proposals to the ministers. We uh, tell them uh, what they should do in their respective fields. For example, the latest proposal is uh, a need for feminism in in universities and feminism on all levels of schooling. This has been uh, successful through, uh, through programs. Uh, we uh, also drive the need for affirmative actions. Uh, one such uh, suggestion is uh, putting up a quota for male nurses in uh, universities to increase the number of male nurses in universities. Uh, we uh, are also mandated to involve men in gender equality work. And I will discuss this in the end of my presentation. This is done through various projects uh, to various degrees of success, I may, may say. Uh, we advise equality committees in municipalities and towns. Equality committees should uh, give us and hand us a equality plan. We uh, have uh, 74, even though we are a small country, we have 74. Uh, municipalities, and this is a large part of our work. Uh, we uh, are in programs to prevent uh, gender-based violence, and uh, most notably, we've been doing this, this uh, in the last uh, three years through a program to coordinate responses to increase the number of indictments. This is a political will of government to increase indictments, and this must be done through how we uh, take care of those that are uh, subjects of uh, violence. Uh, I jump over some points and I won't read them all. As you've seen, I, I've uh, highlighted only uh, some of them. We work against gender stereotyping, uh, especially through uh, getting across uh, complaints to advertisers when they use sexually orientated uh, imagery, etc. Uh, I often uh, begin my lectures on discussing the uh, many issues of gender equality. Gender equality is not a single issue, as you all know, and how they are always interrelating. So also, uh, if they are interrelating in terms of uh, questions and uh, topics, they sometimes present us with, with connected and interrelated solutions. And this has definitely been the, the experience in Iceland. For the last nine years, we have taught the, gender, uh, the Global Gender Gap Index uh, for the World Economic Forum, measuring economic, uh, edu economics, uh, education, uh, access to health, and uh, political empowerment of women. 
the World Economic Forum has not yet introduced an, an a, a index for, for gender-based violence. We hope they will. Uh, this has been a blessing in itself because this has uh, driven attention to gender equality issues for the last nine years. Uh, but it is also a little bit tedious to explain that we need to look at the competition uh, itself when we are ranking the highest, but we have not managed to bridge the gap completely, leaving out something like 50 to 20 percent of a gap between the opportunities of women and men in our country. Uh, uh, some of the uh, interrelated issues uh, I may uh, discuss uh, and uh, give you some insight into. Uh, we often say when we are asked, why are you doing so well in gender equality in Iceland? And uh, if we need to come up with a single explanation, which we don't, of course, but we, we uh, like to simplify things, I like to say uh, universal uh, kindergarten coverage. Uh, municipalities are required by law to take children into kindergartens. This brings the opportunity for women to re-enter the labor market sooner than they would. And uh, as you can see by the statistic, 90% of children aged 1 to 5 uh, are in daycare, more or less uh, 8 hours. Not more much, but uh, at least 8 hours. So this uh, affects the way women enter the labor market, opportunities in the labor market, and also affects uh, women's power within organizations, and thus also women's political uh, power. Uh, this is uh, uh, also connected to a, a, what we would like to call a radical uh, parental leave system, paternity and, and uh, maternity leave system, which was uh, initiated in year 2000 and is uh, special because it, uh, it says to fathers, if you don't use the time we give you, nobody else will have it. Understand? We give you three months and you can stretch these three months a little bit. If you don't use them, nobody else will use them. Uh, then we have three months for mothers and three months parents divide between themselves, which they do more or less in the way that mothers take six months divide the six months into a period of, of uh, a year. And uh, so the system maybe isn't so great in that it really does uh, uh, amplify the gendered system because women are taking the shared leave. They are uh, taking longer periods off the labor market. And sometimes they cannot get their children into the kindergartens before they are one and a half years old. Uh, maybe two years old in, in, in worst cases. So what does that tell us? We have what is called the most progressive uh, parental leave system in the world, but it is really uh, outdated and uh, conservative if you, if you ask us at the center. Uh, there is a lot of attention towards uh, the gender gap and uh, the gender pay gap in particular. Uh, I will divide the rest of my time talking to you about uh, a program we have initiated and, and started working on is the Gender Equal Pay Standard, or the Equal Pay Standard. And uh, then I want to talk about the engagement of Icelandic society with the Me Too movement, and especially how men are involved in driving that uh, in the future uh, by their participation. Uh, in uh, media, we have a lot of discussion about how much gender pay gap there actually is. And, and media is very interested in the percentages. And they come to us year after year and say, OK, the, gender, uh, the uh, adjusted pay gap is now uh, so and so many percentages. What has happened in the meantime? And we really cannot tell them because we have multiple methodologies. And this has been a, a, a constant problem within Nordic comparison as well. You have uh, the research done, and these are multivariate uh, analysis and, uh, and multiple uh, variables uh, put into the analysis will, will give us, uh, uh, or different variables will give us different uh, results. But we uh, are dealing with, in Iceland, a, a real uh, problem with uh, a gender segregated labor market. I told you about our uh, plans for a quota on men in, in nursing. 
men in nursing are something like uh, three to five percent of nurses. In kindergartens, uh, this is the same. So we have huge women uh, uh, labor sectors, and these huge sectors also explain a lot about the uh, gender pay gap in terms of total earnings, which we more and more try to get on the agenda. We need to look at the total amount of salaries paid to women and total amount of salaries paid to men. And this explains their situation and their, their possibility of working and earning. Because this also translates, as we have had uh, discussions about uh, in this conference, this relates also to the amount of, uh, of payments they get when they enter retirement. And if they get little payment, they are more uh, more, uh, uh, they need more social security, uh, they are more dependent on social security and more inclined to, to uh, enter uh, difficult uh, economic uh, circumstances. The equal pay standard, and I really will uh, try to hasten my, my, my introduction about this, it was developed from the year 2008 and entered into force in 2018. It took 10 years to develop through a technical committee. I was on this board for most of the time. We, uh, uh, we uh, did this uh, work in, in cooperation with methodologies of the ISO, International Standard Organization. And uh, this is, in uh, its most simpli uh, simplistic terms, a typical management standard. A management standard like many others, like total quality management standards, uh, environmental standards, etc., which some of you may know. And uh, it uh, has uh, presented us with a, a huge uh, administrative task, a much bigger task than we anticipated really, because it wasn't supposed to be entered into law, it was supposed to be uh, on the initiative of companies and organizations themselves, like the environmental standard, for example. But when it entered into law, uh, we really had to uh, structure the monitoring in a different way. And many, comp uh, many countries are, are very interested in how we develop this, and, and we are in the process of, of uh, replicating the procedure in Portugal and Norway. But it has a lot of problems. It has problems. Uh, first and foremost with regards to its feminist integrity. It is a technical solution and it doesn't really tackle the, the gender dynamics of organizations. Uh, employers, they are handed huge responsibility of deciding themselves what value they place on jobs. But, uh, uh, and again, I will uh, drive through this very quickly. Uh, they can assess the importance of ind individuals and uh, if, the, uh, if the analysis produces a gender gap, they can go back to the analysis and uh, into the job assessment and sort of refigure them. Uh, like any, uh, like most, uh, sorry, uh, management standards, there's an, an initial assessment uh, there, is, uh, there needs to be an initial salary analysis, uh, sort of like a, a ground zero approach. Uh, how are things in the organization now and how do we want them to be? There need to be improvements, planning, implementation, checking, management reviews. And in management reviews, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are in the hands of uh, accredited auditors. And we have built regulations on, on all of these uh, individual uh, things which I, I won't uh, explain. I, I, I referred to the clown yesterday. I could talk on and on about this, but I won't. So I make a, uh, a uh, little bit of a, a hard decoupling here. Me too in Iceland. What happened in the movement in Iceland and how has uh, the government responded to these, these uh, societal uh, changes, if you will? The population was very uh, attentive. We did listen to women. And uh, we can say that uh, any type of, uh, uh, any type of uh, complaining put forth by men 
uh, was uh, shot down quite uh, easily. Uh, this happens at a time when we are also changing the Gender Equality Act in a way to secure the processes for women when they complain about sexual harassment in the workplace. And the Prime Minister has, in uh, the last year, uh, developed some uh, responses that are co coordinated between ministries on different issues. So we can say that uh, we are trying to listen. However, we at the Centre for Gender Equality, or the Directorate of Gender Equality now, we are very uh, concerned that we are not getting enough complaints. They are not coming forth, the women that have been harassed in the workplace. And uh, that is uh, a sign or a signal that the systems are not robust enough. When I say there has not been meaningful resistance, there has also, of course, been this typical speak of a pendulum. You know, a very concerned and understanding man will come forth and say, yes, we understand that you're being harassed, but we are afraid that now the pendulum has moved a little too far, and now all men are victims, possibly, of uh, false allegations. These words, the pendulum, have been uttered in the exact verbatim uh, by uh, Viktor Orban. Uh, so you, you understand where this is coming from. It's a, it's a type of reaction that is just, uh, it fits uh, almost uh, perfectly with the backlash uh, theory. Uh, and we have to be wary of the words that are being used. And we have to remember that what man really can do, what is the best response man can give in uh, hearing these these stories, is not take their own experiences of gender relations and apply them to the stories. Because we do not have the same experiences as women in uh, relations uh, with regards to harassment. So the best we can do is, uh, uh, as crudely as it sounds, uh, shut up a little bit. No, no. Uh, how do we get men involved? Uh, this is what we need to do in the future, uh, especially with regards to uh, men and uh, the sexualization of society, pornification. And these are issues raised by, by men groups that I have been uh, working with and on. Uh, we need to tackle pornography as, uh, as we do not in sex education. Men, young men, are watching pornography, getting limited sex education, bringing their ideas about sex into relationships with devastating effects for partners. We need uh, to educate women, uh, young women about how to leave uh, abusive relationships. They do not have to show some sort of virtue, the, uh, re resilience, uh, in relationship, they, the, the, they do not have to put up with it, right? So we have driven programs uh, uh, by, uh, by non-governmental organizations about what we call sick love. Uh, sick love referring to uh, psychotic uh, jealousy uh, shown and portrayed uh, by both men and women. Uh, and uh, as an indicator of, uh, of, our, uh, of our commitment to educate uh, about the gendered system. Um, there's a need for research into men and prostitution, and a need to discuss prostitution in relation to ethics, looking at the men as sex buyers. We have for too long been afraid of uh, offending men in the discussion on prostitution. Uh, there, is a, there is also a need to bridge uh, theory with practice here, because when looking at the research on prostitution in the Nordic countries, we found, and I found, that there is almost a, a fetishism on the prostitute. We would like to describe the prostitute up to the point where we would like to know where she is working. But uh, that is not what we need. We need uh, information about what drives the buyer, and we need to uh, discuss that without, uh, without uh, of, 
I say with, uh, not without offending, we need to be uh, uh, not afraid of offending. Because who are we offending in this uh, discussion? We have to uh, understand that this is related to multiple issues of, of gender dynamics, uh, human trafficking, of course, and the neoliberal response, which is, you know, if you have talents, you should use them. If you want to be a prostitute, this is what you decide, right? But uh, uh, interview surveys suggest that uh, prostitutes that uh, reflect on their career after having worked there, uh, they never really wanted to be prostitutes. No? Um, we may have different uh, opinions on this, but uh, this is uh, at least uh, mine. I like to reflect uh, and uh, uh, quote a, a Norwegian colleague, uh, a feminist, Kari Jakosen. There is nothing, there will be no uh, synthesis in theory. There, there is nothing abstract about uh, the work of uh, people in prostitution. We do not really need to, to uh, theorize more. We need to help people get out. And, and men are uh, very important in that regard. Uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to end, uh, sorry, because I see my time is uh, up. I'd like to end uh, on a, a little metaphor. Uh, in this book, I told you uh, the Basque history of the world. Mark uh, Kulansky explains how the Basque people learned uh, shipbuilding from uh, whom? The Vikings. No? If, if, you, do not, if, if you did not know. Uh, so, originally, you would put the planks together like this. But the Vikings came sailing down from Norway and Iceland uh, before the 10th century. Uh, and you saw the ships they were sailing they had the planks right up to each other like this. And together, the planks in formation would strengthen the bulk of the ship, allowing for longer voyages. And I would like to apply this metaphor to uh, our discussion about the multiple uh, discriminations in society and whether feminism has a room for other types of discrimination which I, uh, possibly as a, as a male in, in, in the feminist circles, truly believe that we, we do have. And uh, as uh, uh, Marussia uh, told us in the panel before lunch, uh, it is all good and well to have uh, multiple ideas and uh, labels. And we need theory. Theory provides the ground and the basis for our approach and work in gender equality work but we also uh, need to join forces. So we should apply our multiple feminisms and uh, multiple, uh, multiple uh, identities and, uh, and work in a, a uh, formation, uh, therefore getting uh, better results. Thank you. <laughs>